Welcome to the business on Radio Verulam, the voice of your local business community. Hello, it's Sunday, it's 8pm and yes, welcome to the business. I'm Trevor Meriden with the show that's essential listening for the West Hearts business community. Our show this evening has a high-tech theme to it. How in this world of websites, social media and the like can you get your business noticed? We have Jason Salmon of FL1. They specialise in websites and solutions no matter what the size, whether you're talking about a simple one-page website uh, or an international scale website. Um, Cheryl Luzet from Wagada also joins us. She's an expert in SEO. Then we have Adrian Hawkins from uh, Worldability. He also also runs Biz for Biz, which is not just a networking group, but also a lot more besides. Last week's guest, Laura Moxon from Tech, Tech Angels, will return as well to give us her top tips. And of course, there's our diary planner, a roundup of the week ahead. But first, what's in the business news? As ever, I'm joined by Roma Bomick and Claire McAnulty. Good evening, ladies. Hello there. And um, um, Claire, what's in the uh, what, sorry, Roma? What's in the news for you this week? Well, hi, Trevor. Again, um, and well. I don't know if either of you saw the Andrew Marr show this morning, but they picked up on a story that appeared in the press earlier this week. Essentially, the tagline was UK economy on the mend after a 0.6% growth, says the Chancellor. Apparently, the UK economy is on the mend after figures showed that, um, as the, the tagline stated, there was growth of 06 in the last three months to June. Um, and George Osborne was, Osborne was keen to get that message across. Essentially, he said this growth was based on um, output which has grown in the construction, manufacturing, services and agricultural sectors, um, according to the Office for National Statistics. Um, and it said the figures meant that the economy has recouped more than half the 7.2% of output lost in 2008-2009 recession. So there's quite a bit of debate this morning um, on the Andrew Marr show. Vince Cable was their key guest uh, when it came to that debate. Um, it was very interesting. I don't know what you guys think. We've talked about this kind of thing before on the show, the good old green shoots discussion. Are we seeing a reflection of these figures in Hertfordshire, do you think? I'm not sure about this because we've had so many false starts, haven't we, with, mm. with the green shoots of recovery. And my feeling just now is that people are still quite nervous about making decisions involving mm. money. That's my gut feeling yeah so it's quite difficult when when you've given all these different numbers um you, you can't dispute them yeah but all yeah. you can see is how how it feels in in your own immediate community and i would say it feels quite similar at the moment to how it did a month or two ago mm -hmm. is that good or bad do you think i think people are just in a holding position at the moment uh -huh. I, don't, I don't know that it's necessarily positive or negative but people are just keeping themselves in a holding position mm. until they genuinely feel that the jobs are secure or they've mm. got money coming in or whatever. People are just being, I think, ultra cautious. Cautious, yeah. It's a difficult one, isn't it? We quite rightly have said so many times in the past that we're fed up of hearing negative news. And actually, I guess you can't win in a way because this is a piece of positive data. And actually, there was a hell of a lot of argument around whether or not it, it actually does demonstrate a positive upturn or whether it is more fudging of figures. Um, and we're kind of being very cynical about it. I don't know. It's really difficult, isn't it? There are those that argue, actually, if you talk a market up, people tend to react positively. I think, too, that because things have been quite down for quite a long time, people need quite a lot of convincing at the moment. Mm. They, mm. they need quite a lot of reassuring that, that, that the, the green shoots are actually happening. We've had, we've had quite a few false starts, haven't we? I mean, it, it's, we, we, we've been in situations where, you know, we've had our potential double dip and potential triple dip, and then the double dip was just a dream and it never really happened. And, and I don't know, I think people don't know, they don't really have any trust in, in figures or officials or even, you know, or, I say, or even politicians, especially politicians, mm -hmm. perhaps. And they're just not quite sure what to believe. And, you know, and I think talk of optimism, I think you're right, Roma, does really, does, does help. But it can't sustain something that isn't mm. there. And, mm. uh, and you can sort of go, it'd be a sort of variation around a theme. You could exaggerate an, an upturn, but you can't, mm. you can't just talk up something if things are going 
belly up. You no, know? So, no, um, absolutely. So it's, it's a difficult I one. mean, it is an interesting one, and we bounce backwards and forwards on this particular issue. I think it'd be great if we could get some kind of survey going ourselves in the region. I mean, I, f- I don't know. Sometimes I wonder that things might speak volumes. Last night, yet again, tried to book a, a table for dinner. It took me three goes to get a, a reservation. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know what our listeners think. As usual, you can maybe tweet us your thoughts on the matter. Um, we are either on um, at RV the Business on Twitter or email us at to the business at radioverilum.com. Claire. Well, the story that I noticed this week was, was one about Facebook. Uh, Facebook has taken a bit of a hammering recently. Um, a lot of users have been rushing to change the privacy settings ahead of this new graph search that's not gone down too well. But this week, There was good news for Facebook, and that was that the first quarter's figures show that the revenue from mobile ads pushed Facebook's revenue up by 38%. And this figure is important, and it's important that it's mobile ads, because at the tail end of last year, the number of daily Facebook users on mobile devices surpassed the number accessing it on desktops. And... Facebook know that to continue to do well, they they really must make mobile work for them. Um, So it's quite interesting, this thing now with with mobile. And I just wondered, do you think, do you find yourself accessing websites more on your mobile than you used to? Or do you still wait till you get back to the, the desktop? I definitely do, because you mm. find that a lot of companies now have a mobile version of their own website. Um, I hadn't realised the link with Facebook, though. I don't know. Trevor? No, I hadn't realised that either. Um, yeah, no, Facebook now, have a, they have a an application you can download so that you can access nearly all of the Facebook functions that you have on the desktop, and you can, mm. you can access it now on your mobile phone. So, right. so it's actually on this that they've been putting all these mobile ads. Oh, I see. And of course, they've been quite nervous about it because if, yeah. if, if they hadn't done well with the mobile ads, it, it would have been bad, mm. very bad news for them. Um, excuse me, you mentioned something right at the start. It was a grass test, you said? I mean, what, was, what, was, what was that you no, said? No, it's a thing called graph search. Graph test, I'm oh, sorry. A graph, <laughs> graph test. It's, <laughs> my, it's my accent. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's this new search and it's it's quite um I think the feeling was it was quite oh. intrusive. Okay. So people felt it was quite intrusive because actually um items that they had marked under private on their Facebook page was were going to become public to their friends. Mm. So people were a bit concerned about it. Mm. So Facebook got in a bit of a sort of negative press over it. I must admit, I don't like the whole idea of adverts. Whenever you go onto YouTube, you have these silly adverts at the beginning you've got to click. In fact, it doesn't let you always click to cancel them straight away. I find it quite frustrating. Mm, They they are quite intrusive, that's a problem. And the same Mm. with mobile ads, because in terms of real estate, the phone is so small, Mm. the screen is so small that Mm. an ad, in order to work, has to take up a certain amount of space. and Mm -hmm. And it is quite intrusive. Yeah. 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 That's right. I've um, uh, my my thing's not so much in the news, but is is actually a, something that happened to me this week. Um, in that, um, uh, you know, I've had two good years in my business, and and this week I I lost a client. Um, oh. now it happens. No, oh, yeah, oh. it happens. It happens, <laughs> but it happens to the best of us. <laughs> and um, and sometimes you have situations where it's budget cutbacks or something's gone wrong in the relationship, or but most of the time. These things happen, mm. you know, and um, and you know it's not it's not as uh, devastating as losing a, a, a job, but of course, naturally, it's a blow to the uh, to the to the ego and and uh, and so on. But also, I, I was thinking this week actually is a bit of an opportunity, um, you know, and it, it maybe many businesses should really sort of start to see things in a slightly different light. That you know, you may lose a client, but you've got an opportunity to focus on something or think about the direction of your your business. And and so I just scribbled down some things about how um, how to handle the sort of transition you know, one is about not taking it personally um, because well it might be but I don't think it is <laughs> and, uh, um, um, but, but then evaluate what went well and what went badly you know um, to really sort of um, be talking to other um, other other clients as well, sort of redoubling efforts with other other clients. Of course, and above anything else, even if you've stopped working for whatever reason, just to keep you know keep on a friendly note with the uh, the client. And uh, but you know that's just that was just my little scribble list. I mean, have you been through those situations? And what did you what, what did what, how did you deal with them? Yeah, I think I I when I started I started my business about three years ago, and quite near the beginning, I 
I got a client that I thought was going to be a complete gold mine. I just thought, oh, this is great. This is fantastic way to start. Absolutely brilliant. It turned it. It didn't work out just because they didn't really have the funds. And I think part of the disappointment is that in your own head, you project. Yeah. You project a story with you know how you're going to do business with that client, how great it's going to be, and you've you've got this whole scenario already going on in your head. So mm. when when the thing collapsed, you're not only dealing with just the disappointment of that moment because you're thinking, oh, that's a shame, but you've actually got this whole story that you've concocted that's 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 going nowhere. So I think it is. It, 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 you do take quite a blow when it happens yeah. because you you kind of um, foresee a future with this person yeah. as well in future business, and yeah. it, it disappears over overnight as well. Yeah. I, th- I think the thing, particularly when you're running your own consultancy-based business, is that because you work on your own for yourself, yeah. there's um, also the social aspect. And I think we all like to feel like we belong somewhere, don't we? And when yeah. you've built a good relationship with a client, you've worked over time with them, hmm. you there's a danger that you almost forget you're not friends with each other, even though you may have become very friendly, yeah. maybe even a bit closer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end of the end of the day, business is business. So it is a little bit of a blow sometimes to yeah. the ego. Yeah. But I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head at the beginning of, of your little segment there where you said that um, one of the most important things you realised was that, you, you know, you almost don't want to put all your eggs into one basket. Mm. And to do that can be quite dangerous to the survival of your business. Absolutely. Ab- Absolutely. Well, I feel like I've been through a little therapy session. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you feel better. I do, yeah. I do, I do. We'll do. send and you the bill now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, and we'll be coming back and, uh, and, and talking to, uh, to Jason um, uh, uh, straight after these, uh, these messages. Hi, this is Danny Smith. Join me weekdays from 4 till 7pm for West Ham's Drive Time. With features including Chris's Film Club, Pound Saver, Community Notice Board, Calendar Artist, Hot Topics and many more besides. We also feature correspondents covering topics such as lifestyle, consumer advice, cooking, interior design and travel. We have regular interviews, local news and sports, celebrity birthdays, travel and traffic updates and competitions as well. That's all on West Hart's Drive Time with me, Danny Smith, on 92.6 FM, Radio Verulam. Radio Verulam Community Partners. Dagnall Street Baptist Church has a welcoming, friendly atmosphere and can be found in the city centre. Regular Sunday services are held at 10.30am and 6.30pm. There are also weekday social meetings, special events and concerts. Our busy, relaxed coffee shop deserves a visit and is open 10 till 2, Monday to Saturday. Our website, www.dsbc.org.uk, has details of our regular programme and future events, plus the opportunity to download our monthly magazine. We also have a Facebook page where you can catch up on our latest news and chat. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on radioverulam.com. Welcome back to The Business. It's about uh, quarter past eight. Um, and now we've got our interview slot and I'm going to hand you over to Claire. Thanks, Trevor. I'm here today with Jason Salmon and Jason's the technical director of FL1 Group. Uh, good evening, Jason. How are you? Hi, Claire. You're right. Now, I understand that FL1 do much more than just design websites. Mm-hmm. How- however, tonight we are going to concentrate on that side of the business. But I understand that FL1 have got a big birthday coming up next year. That's right, yeah, 10 years old. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Congratulations. It seems well like done. only yesterday all started, though. And what do you think? The, are, there, are there differences between websites, designing websites when you started and mm. websites now? Because that's quite a long period of time, isn't it? It is, yeah, it's quite a big difference. I mean, I think when we started off, um, well, what, what's kind of happened over, over the years is now there are many standard tools for building websites. And I think when we first started, it was effectively everything was built ground up, there weren't any standard content management tools so when I say content management tools these are software that will run your website that predominantly you can go in and edit your website with so certainly when we started most websites tended to be static you'd have static pages put on the web if you wanted them changed you'd have to download them or get a web designer to download them make the changes and put them back up so certainly back then if you wanted a content managed website that you could go in and edit yourself that was quite a big deal um quite often companies would write their own systems to do this and over the years that's 
changed quite a lot really so now having a content managed system and the concept of managing your own website and doing it yourself is is quite common whereas a little bit unthought of 10 years ago and it was cost restrictive whereas also same thing with with e-commerce that's come on leaps and bounds uh people are very much more aware of google very much more aware of uh, social networks again 10 years ago the likes of facebook or well, facebook wasn't even around um so it was quite different in that sort of respect, a lot simpler. So yeah, things I think, have I think a lot. too now, um, I mean, there's a big emphasis now on keeping content fresh, isn't there? Yes. So, so, so very much what you're talking about, that, that businesses need to be able mm. to go into their own website. It needs to yeah. be easy enough yeah. that they, without any technical knowledge as such, they can go in and, and freshen up the content, maybe Definitely. add blog posts, that type of thing. And that yeah. probably wasn't as common Nine no. or ten years ago, that that's been a, quite a big change. Yes, no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, there is a big shift. Business owners, we, um, this is something we advise. You know, businesses should be fully in control of their website. You know, it is an important tool. It's another communication tool. In the same way as you wouldn't outsource answering the phone to someone else, mm. it's something you should be familiar with, something comfortable with, and that's now possible. And it wasn't so possible back in ten years ago. But as you say, writing blogs and articles, websites say ten years ago tended to be a lot more one-sided. So you'd have say the home page and about us and contact us it was all tend to be written very much from the from the, the business owners view of the world speaking out and things have changed very much more and been a lot more two-sided now people are encouraging their customers to talk back and communicate back using in their own terms with mm -hmm. their own platforms twitter social media but even the way that wording is used now uh, yeah. much more targeted towards customers there's a lot different thinking now from a marketing communications point of view. Do you, do you still find that uh, there are a large number of people who try and use the website as a one-way form of communication oh, rather definitely. than a, a two-way? I mean, when yes. I talk to people in my, my business, it, it's, it's, that's, that, that still seems to be very much of a, a problem. There are a lot of people who, quotes, don't get it, you know, yes. the two-way. And, and I'm, I'm constantly surprised how many of them there are. Still. Yeah. S sometimes to be brutally honest, sometimes it's the easiest way because I think some people need a website and sometimes it's just the simplest place just for them to start. Yeah, it's and just get like something. an address, isn't yeah. it? Somewhere for people to find them, yeah. maybe yeah. for some people. Yeah. Be, I mean, be it a business card of sorts. I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of what we'd call a classic first generation website. And then mm. I think once then, as people get familiar with the old idea, then the second phase website will take over from that. Sure. So, in general, people coming, businesses coming to you then to get a website, are, are they generally well clued up? Or what, what are the mistakes that they do they tend to come mm. to you with absolutely no idea and, and hope that you'll sort of come up with? structure for them or, or do they tend to be quite gened up nowadays? A um, bit of all sorts. I mean we get some people that are pretty clued up. Um, I think most most these days we tend to get a lot of people that have perhaps had a website before which makes our life a lot easier so they know some of the come of, come of the basics and some of some of the jargons not completely over their head. But that said I mean I suppose Certainly over the last couple of years with the recession, what we did find is a lot of our clients were, say, made redundant in the city. So perhaps, you know, 10, 15 years experience in whatever they did, starting up as consultants. So there's an awful lot of kind of one-man band startups and people, you know, very fresh to the idea. And the way that we got around that was because we feel it's important. People really need to know what they're getting involved with in terms of the landscape. In terms of if you were going to start a high, high street shop, you'd need mm. to know kind of what your landscape is and before you started trading. So the way we got around that was by running the workshops. So we run workshops on about eight different subjects from planning a website through to search engines, through to social media marketing. And the whole idea of that really was to save us doing a lot of meetings over and over <laughs> yeah. again, just to kind of get people familiar with what the basics are so that then they could make an informed decision before they started building a website. And I understand a lot of the workshops are free that you run. So they, so they encourage people to come in mm -hmm. and, and have a little taster, yeah. perhaps, just yeah. to find out a little bit of, of information. And also That's to meet you yeah. as well, you know, That's because it. obviously they want to know who's, who's going to be d doing the design yeah. and so on. I mean, the common mistake that people do is they come along and say, right, um, I need an online shop. And sometimes you need to sort of say, well, hang on a minute. OK, that's what you think is the solution. Tell me what your problem is. Mm. Because you tend to find that it's just the same with any business, isn't it? Sometimes you could get right back to, this, to the problem and say, well, the problem is you need more business. Well, the online shop isn't the best way to do that. Perhaps one of these other tools is. Yes. Because some, I mean, a good example, we did a, a website, say, recently for someone selling, uh, they were selling parts for, say, plumbing. And in their mind, an online shop was the answer. They wanted every single nut, every bolt, Everything in that shop had to be online. And the reality is to source, what, 60,000 nuts and bolts to get all of that data together yeah. to put on a website. And photographs and all the exactly. things that people yeah. expect nowadays. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And he was the first to say, do you know what, Jason, we haven't got any time. <laughs> haven't got enough people here. We need more business. And 
you had to kind of go back to the basics and say, well, this isn't the right route for you guys. Yeah. yeah. And and we were talking a bit earlier, Jason, about uh, mobile websites and now the, the, they've become more and more popular. I mean, mm-hmm. do you find now that you do mobile versions of websites or, or what do you advise your, your business clients to do about the mobile side mm-hmm. of things? I think it depends. Um, people get very hung up on mobile websites. So uh, there are different types of mobile websites. So a classic mobile website, take, for example, Facebook or Google, they're very functional al- applications, if you're really, and they're not really websites. So the mobile version of that website would be a um, streamlined down version of that same functionality, but optimized for a mobile. It's actually a completely autonomous website. Yeah. It's using the same content, but it's almost two se- separate bits of code, two separate websites running on different platforms. That, for most businesses, is completely overkill and unnecessary, because mm. you are going to have two di- different websites, two different sets of development costs. Um, I think what you could say is it really depends on how much your market you feel are going to be looking at your website on a mobile. If you're using, um, say for example, an estate agent, then that might warrant something like that. People are going to be out in the field, they're going to be using mobile devices, looking at houses in real time. Good example. Consultant's website, well if you're blogging a lot, quite possibly, because if you're using social media, as you rightly said earlier, so many people are using social media now, Mm. yes they could well be getting to your website. So what we do tend to advise people to maybe look at is a responsive website. The responsive website effectively is something that will resize and has three different sizes. But it's right. the same code, same content, same images, but the layout is subtly different. And that's kind of like a nice halfway house, and mm-hmm. it keeps your design costs right down as well. Mm. But bare minimum is a website that's mobile accessible, i.e. does it render the same on every single device? I think every business should have that. But the only thing that's probably worth saying is that a website that was built, say, a few years ago, the chances are it probably wouldn't work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, another thing that business owners get quite hooked, um, sort of head up about, myself included, is um, search engine optimization. That we're all trying to get ourselves on the first page of Google. We feel if we're not on the first page of Google, Google that we're not going to get found. Mm. Is is that a large part of your business? Do you do you get yes. involved with search engine optimization? We do, and that's that's a really tough one. It's I think a lot of the th- things that you sort of classic classic say to businesses what do you want to be optimised for? And the op- stop response is, well, everything, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and in reality, it's, it's a bit of a tough one. I, I suppose what I tend to sort of say to businesses, first of all, is what's the role of your website? If mm. it's there to close doors, i.e. you're meeting a customer, you'll direct them to your signpost, and it's there once they've met you for them to get a bit of a good feel about you, credibility, to help close that sale. Search engine optimization probably isn't so key. Hmm. Whereas the main thing is if you're looking to search engine optimization, optimize a website, is it's very ch- different the way that you design a website. Hmm. Suddenly, you'd have to forget about how you see the world and what you describe your packages to be and look at what people are searching for and hmm. build pages really to reflect that. So hmm. if your customer's asking for widgets in St. Albans, you need to be very clear to make sure you have a page that says you sell widgets, you cover St. <laughs> you're Albans. In St. Albans. Yep. And so it's a very different way in which you'd architect your website. Do you have to do, it must be quite a, a delicate consultancy skill to be able to tell somebody that the words that they currently have on their website, are, whilst they mean a lot to them, you know, don't actually mean a lot you know, to, their, to their customers. I mean, how, do you, how do you deal with that sort of difficult moment? Um, it's a tricky one. I mean, in an ideal world, things like the workshops are good because you tend to get people come in and walk out and go, oh, I get it now. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Um, yeah. We tend to use questionnaires quite a lot, and yeah. they're really aimed to sort of make so people sit down and think these sort of things through. Um, but we can use keyword research as well. And keyword research is effectively you're asking Google, so widgets, St. Albans, how many people type that phrase and phrases like that. Mm. Mm. And I think usually once you get some of that sort of information in front of a business owner, they can normally start to sort of figure out the differences. Sure. Landing pages are also a good way around that. So these are pages that sort of sit with your website out as well as some of the main content in there, but they're driven around some of those key terms. <coughs> so it's difficult one to... Uh, usually examples are the best way to show people yeah I think as well I, I think I think I remember reading last week that the, that, that Google itself said that 27% of the website visits were search engines which which actually means that 73% of them mm. don't come through search engines so in other words people find your website maybe through social media yeah. through you simply emailing them perhaps to say go and look at my yeah, website or definitely. a business card mm. so it's quite interesting I think people's perception is is Google, Google, 
search engines <laughs> and it's actually not true. It's certainly not true mm. now with so much social media and everything. Well, two things I'd say. We've got a lead generation website that we use and we rank on number one, number two in Google for about 70 different terms. Now, we probably get, say, one or two inquiries a week on that website. If I then turn on Google Advertising, we get about one or two a day. And a lot mm. of people say, well, I never click on those. And think, well, the proof's there. Yeah. But the other thing is I tend to say with Google, if you're launching a new website, it normally takes in the region 12 months to start to rank properly in Google. Mm. So my advice would normally, if you build into your marketing strategy to build links into your website, your social media, do everything but Google, then you'll find Google will take care of itself. Right. So would, would that be your final piece of advice to people then, not to get too concerned about the Google aspect then and to, to maybe work on the social media and the, the, the other um, ways of getting people to go to the website? I think so. Google's not the only game in town, although it is a good one. Don't get too hung up. But build the website with Google in mind, make it accessible, but walk away from it and focus on all the other marketing methods. Okay, that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, we could talk, probably talk about this. As I know our, our listeners are really interested in this. Absolutely, uh, websites in this are big, big news, aren't they, for all of us? Big, big news for all of us and all for all of our, our listeners and uh, everyone out there. We get lots, probably more questions about that. Than, and before uh, we go, else. do you want to just give us your yeah. website address, Jason, so absolutely. people can contact you? Yeah, you can check us out on www.fl1group.com or on Facebook or on Twitter or on <laughs> Foursquare or pretty much anywhere you could think of. Fantastic. We'll have you back on our panel a little, uh, a little bit later. Thanks, Thank then. you very much, Jason. Thank you. Wondering what you could do this weekend? Well, you don't have to go far from home. There's plenty to discover on your doorstep. Join me, Ellie O'Fira, this Friday at midday when we'll be giving you some great ways to get out and about close to home. That's Out and About, Friday at midday, here on 92.6 FM, Radio Verulam. Radio Verulam Community Partners. The St Albans District Talking Newspaper is a local charity which offers a free news service to people who are visually impaired. News is taken from the Hearts Advertiser and is read and recorded onto cassette tapes and memory sticks which are sent out each week. If you know someone who is visually impaired who might be interested, please ring Linda Randall on 01582 832275 for more information. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. If you want to get in touch with the business on Radio Verulam, phone us on 01727 839 926 or email thebusiness at radioverulam.com. Welcome back to The Business. Uh, it's just coming up to half past eight. Now, I know that... Um, uh, our key theme is around technology. But as you know, we're always keen um, to hear about other walks of uh, business life. And we talked to a very interesting gentleman recently called uh, Adrian Hawkins from Weldability, um, which is a business in Stevenage. But he wasn't really talking to us just in that, um, that guise. He was also talking to us about um, a, a, a group called um, uh, Biz for Biz, which uh, started about three and a half years ago. It's not just a networking group. Um, it's a lot more than that, more of a I suppose, a big picture pressure group for local businesses with clout. And here he is having a, a fascinating interview with, um, with um, Vicky Scott. Here we go. My name's Adrian Hawkins. I'm chairman of Worldability SIP, which is a company based in Letchworth in Hertfordshire. And uh, I started that business about 33, 34 years ago. And um, we have acquired a number of different companies involved in the welding supply and manufacturing industry. And as a result of that experience... Um, over the years, I've often felt like uh, I've been slightly alone as a voice in the wilderness. <laughs> and uh, talking to other business people, I found that there was a, a real sort of desire to get together because, you know, there are trade unions with people who are working. There are all sorts of help and uh, helpful organisations out there, but not an awful lot for the entrepreneur and the, and the business owner. So we came up with an idea of myself and my colleague Paul Beasley, we're co, uh, co-founders for Biz for Biz, and um, we come up with an idea called Biz for Biz and basically have gone about creating a network all the way across Hertfordshire where we effectively aim to speak to other CEOs and managing directors uh, who are similarly alone, making decisions for their business for the future and um, coming up with exactly the same problems as we are. So uh, we hold a number of events every year. But there's a big difference to this, because this isn't just ordinary networking. Guys, no, 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 this, this is, is this just is, not networking. This is just, so, so tell us, what's that piece that makes this so different? 
Um, well, I think, firstly, there are people who have run... There's seven directors of Biz for Biz, and we all run successful businesses. So, first and foremost, we all have an appetite for making sure that business is easy, simple, um, and that some of the people that interact with businesses, like local authorities, county, councillors, um, the LEP, and all those sorts of organisations, are recognising clearly what... Uh, our requirements are as people running businesses because in effect we're investing in Hertfordshire, we're employing local people, we're developing the economy of Hertfordshire and um, from time to time you do feel like you're getting a sort of a, a raw deal in terms so, of... So would you call it a pressure group? Uh, I would say that probably that's more likely as about the, the voice of um, business um, joining up and getting together and um, we think that as a, as a group of business professionals we... Um, we probably have an opportunity to sort of... You've sort of got more clout. A bit more clout, and um, that's much better than us all sort of muttering under our breath in our offices on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So logic says that, you know, if we, can, if we can get together and understand each other's problems and share those problems, and I always say that a problem shared is a problem halved, um, or so doubled, we, or depending doubled, on which one it is. Or made slightly more <laughs> controversial. Um, but, you know, there are... I think government generally now believes that the future isn't about financial services, it's about businesses working together with the local authorities and developing an environment that employs people. And if we're to get our balance of payments right in this country and we're starting to export products, then we've got to get ourselves to a stage where everybody's on board with that same scenario. Absolutely. And rather than just get, getting offices together as business start-up arrangements for uh, half a chair, which are great in their own selves, we need to start having bases where we can start manufacturing things and shipping those things all over the world and getting hardcore currency back into our economy. Um, so it's a, lot, it's a lot more to it once you get past why can't I park my car on the road sort yes, of problem. Yes. So, you know, that's the, those are the sort of issues. So it's really looking at a bigger picture. Yeah, the macroeconomic yeah, community, yeah. really. And it's, and, it's, and it's getting together with other businesses that have got clout because they are employing so many people, because they represent potentially the growth future of, of um, UK PLC or, or, UK or PLC, whatever. Yeah. whatever. And, and how long has this been going on? Well, we, we started about three and a half years ago. It really is gather, a gathering traction now. We have MPs that are prepared to come along to what we call our CEO forums and uh, entrepreneur forums. And they come along and they'll face 30 or 40 business people who previously have identified the problems that they're experiencing. And what we want them to do is to inter interact with local politicians and national politicians and even European politicians, yeah, because yeah. it's all very well us sort of shouting at the radio or, yeah. or stamping our feet in our office, but sometimes you've got to say it to the people that matter. And, and have you surprised. had some successes? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have delivered on a number of things. I mean, one of the things that, that's a big problem in Hertfordshire at the moment is the skill shortage. And, um, you know, I myself am working with um, the North Arts College. I'm also uh, involved in the Studio Schools uh, Trust in, in Hertfordshire. And um, so those sorts of things have started to happen as a re direct result of us being out there saying we're open for business and we're ready to inter interact with you. And colleges generally, they have a requirement to get work placements on yes, board, yes. so they need to get a closer liaison going with business. So it's staggering, it's, isn't it? You know, you've got yeah. a problem over there, you've got yeah. a problem over there, and, and actually there is no link until you sort of create, so you're creating those sorts of links. So we're, we're, working, we're working with, with education um, organisations like schools and colleges, and we mustn't just limit it to colleges because, you know, schools really is where people start to think about what they're going to do when they're 16 and 18 and, and so on. And I think once we start getting those problems overcome, I mean, we can start getting back to an industrialised economy again, which, uh, you know, moves us well away from the, the banking yeah. sort of... Well, it's interesting, I, I've just um, done some research which has actually been launched next week, which highlights this, this issue being a skill shortage in many areas. The, the optimistic businesses are not needing or looking for finance... What a lot of these companies, so, so you know, there's been this enormous focus on finance, but actually, it doesn't appear to be the big issue that the optimistic businesses are really, really looking to um, to resolve. You know, they've got problems with recruitment, as you say, skills shortages. Um, they're looking also for external help as well. You know, so and possibly in you know, in, 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 like Dragon's Apprentice sort of stuff. So, in uh, with a view to equity 
to e- equity uh, investment, investment and, and, and yeah, all of that sort of thing in that way. So there's there's a whole heap of stuff that's sort of going on that's not really being addressed, and it sounds as though your group is really trying to look to address some of these yeah. actual issues as opposed to perceived issues that, yeah. when it comes to the reality, just aren't there. Absolutely, and, and you know, in recognition of what the problems are, we're trying to get the right people to understand what they are. I was at a meeting earlier today with the LEP. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to get an idea as to what to do for Hertfordshire generally. And, um, you know, you'd be surprised at the sort of the, the sheer mountain they have to climb if they're going to sort of really get control over the sort of local business economy. And a big part of that is about interfacing with, um, with local business people. Yes. And until such time as they understand those sort of issues, you know, it's not really going to happen for them. So hence the reason why we're deciding to work much closer with them and help them as much much as we possibly can to, to come to terms with those issues. It sounds like a brilliant initiative. How do people get involved? Is it by invitation only? No, no, not at all. We have a web- website, www.bizforbiz.org. And uh, on there is all the information about the directors of the of the organisation, um, how to join if they want to join. The, the, you don't have to be a member to come to any of our events that we run, um, because at the end of the day, we're obviously trying to give everybody a taste of um, you know what we can offer as, a, as an, a, an organisation. And uh, you know, uh, but if they want to become a member and help the wider course yeah. uh, of you know, us developing the voice for Hertfordshire, yes. then we're there to um, accept a membership free if they want to. And it also sounds as though it's an incredibly strong network. Oh, yes. So, so you've got that in the background as well. Yeah. So just say the website again and then... It's www.biz4biz.org. That was Adrian Hawkins from uh, Weldability and uh, Business for Business. As I said, he started about three and a half years ago, and it's not just a networking group. It's um, it's very much more, um, uh, as Vicky described, a big uh, uh, picture pressure group for, for local businesses with clout. I love the fact that Vicky is always gets some sort of noise <laughs> going in the background. I don't know if those are the welding machines, or, yeah. or um, and, and, but, but it sounded, and it's good because it shows genuinely that we really are out there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. Talking to people in their, in their places of work, but it's funny, isn't it? How she you know always, what we should do? What, what's that? When we do our Christmas special, maybe yeah. we could have a little competition and put a segue of, oh, is that what you call it? A selection of these clips together and see if listeners can guess where what she the is. background noise <laughs> is. Yeah, where she is. Where's Vicky instead of where's Wally? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so we're going to the panel uh, part of our we discussion, are. just coming up to 20 minutes to uh, to nine. And, uh, and Roma, who have we got? Well, um, as you know, every week we debate the big business issues. And this week we're welcoming back Jason Salmon, Technical Director of FL1. Um, Jason, it was very interesting hearing how you've made a success of your business Thank so you. far. Um, and we're also introducing Cheryl Luzet from Wagada, who's described as a search engine optimization expert so welcome to you both good evening evening. (laughs) and Cheryl maybe you could briefly tell us about your organization and how you help other businesses okay sure I help companies to maximize the potential of their websites so um, a lot of companies set up a website and think the work is over but I kind of come in at that point and help them to raise their online profile and really get as much traffic as they can to their websites Right, okay. Well, I'm sure we'll be finding out even more. And you've um, very kindly agreed to come on and tell us even more about your business in December. So we'll look forward to that interview. Thank you. Okay, well, our first topic for debate is around the idea of using Twitter to test a business idea. Behind every successful business is a great idea. But how do you test your, how do you test the waters and find out whether or not your business um, I- business plan is worth the paper it's written on? getting my words tripping over my words again today um, the Guardian small business pages asked the business Twitterati for their tips on how best to research the market and decided whether an, uh, and decide whether an idea for a company is worth pursuing feedback included easy ask the people your future customers if they like it want it will buy it at this price and see how big that group is Another one commented, when you get positive feedback from potential customers that are strangers, then you could also know that you're, you're on the right, you could know that you're on the right track. So in general, the poll which The Guardian ran on Twitter suggested that this kind of research was a great way to test the strength of your plan. But is it really a good idea? Now, my thoughts are surely there's a risk of potential competitors jumping on your idea and going to market before you get a chance to. But what do you guys think? Jason, maybe you could kick us off on this one. Um, I think it's a good question. 
Um, my personal feeling, if you're too worried about your competitors, perhaps you know stealing the idea. In reality, I think if you feel about that the way about many things, then you probably wouldn't get out of bed and cross the road in the morning. This is true. <laughs> but I think the idea of testing something full stop is a good idea. I mean, one of my biggest regrets in our business is probably not putting together a business plan and testing it. I think what we did, like so many, we went out there and said, we're going to build websites just because we're going to build websites. And we didn't look at it through. We didn't research the market. We didn't really... We knew that people needed websites, but we didn't know why. We didn't know how much. And I think we suffered for that a little bit, and I think a lot of businesses do. So I think be it Twitter, be it Facebook, be it LinkedIn, or be it even just another way would be doing some sponsored um, listings with Google, or using AdWords, testing it out with a simple one page just to see what your online market doing. Any way of testing and measuring. But I think also what's important is to be able to listen to that and take real readings and walk away from it if it's a bad idea and that's a tough one mm. and I think a lot of people just be, fall in love with that idea of doing it and are not really willing to listen uh, to the fact that it might not be viable or to, or to change it do you, mean so, a, do you mean a sort of beta testing you know that yeah. you're, you're, you're asking a, what, mm. a, a, a small group do you mean or yeah I mean that's right I mean sometimes what we've done with websites that could potentially be a lot bigger but can be a huge amount of risk is just put something very very small together with a very simple idea and just test it online first just to yeah. see whether it's viable right because uh, certainly I'm sure Sarah will tell you with an online audience if you if you're optimizing for Google sometimes it's good to test whether there is actually an audience there and what they're searching for before investing a lot of time optimizing it yeah. mm. otherwise it could be a waste of money yeah. mm. so any form of testing like that can be cheap and can save you thousands. Mm. So a good point to bring Cheryl in, actually. Cheryl, what are your thoughts? I think this sort of um, sort of engagement and sort of approaching your customer's idea is, is one of the brilliant ways of using Twitter um, because Twitter is an excellent way of reaching out with people that you wouldn't normally um, be able to have a conversation with. And it's amazing the the engagement you can get in with people who wouldn't normally, you know, even talk to you, who wouldn't, you know, if you emailed them, you wouldn't get a reply. Whereas on Twitter, they're quite happy to have a conversation with you. So I think it is a really brilliant way of getting some valuable market research from your target audience mm -hmm. um, but I think if you just start asking random questions you might not potentially get the engagement back that mm -hmm. you're hoping for so I think maybe your questions have to be quite targeted you have mm. to know already who you're wanting to talk to um, and in also, order to get the feedback and also I suppose easy to answer because if you're asking on Twitter then they haven't got much much room I yeah, suppose yeah it's only to, 140 to characters <laughs> yes exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and in fact I was being controversial at the beginning when I suggested why would you want to do that your competitors <laughs> will jump on your idea but played very nicely into my hands because <laughs> it is interesting there's a lot of evidence to show that yeah. people do return tweets or people mm. will yes, tweet and engage exactly. in conversation and yet they won't answer calls they yes. won't return emails why do you think that is? Is it just about the 140 characters? What do you think that's all about? Um, I think it's a difficult... I mean, people feel a little bit cocooned. It's in the same way as you see someone that, if they pulled out in front of you in a car, they're quite happy to look at you and rant and rave and wave their fist around because they know that you can't really chase them up the road. <laughs> Whereas in the same thing, I think Twitter, people are a little bit cocooned. They're yeah. using that kind of direct contact in quite the same way. There's a level of anonymity as well, which mm. I think helps. I think people are quite flattered when they get a tweet. I think there's still a quite a lot of novelty around Twitter. So yeah. when you see that someone's tweeted you, you think, oh, that's quite mm. nice, and yes. it makes you more inclined to reply. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. so forget with 140 characters, and the way that you'd probably do it if you really had some research is you'd probably have something like a survey monkey yes. or a short... you you're really attached to it. Yeah, exactly. link yes. to it. Yeah. Exactly, link out yeah. to it, you get around about So one. have you both used Twitter to research your market? Mm, not Ever? really, I wouldn't I've say... I once put a tweet out to say we're looking for ideas for workshops. Yeah. And? And we got some good response, and we also had someone said, how about pork pie making? <laughs> <laughs> so it just shows you could, get, you could get any kind of response back. <laughs> was, that, was that Jim's pork pies? <laughs> 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 They're offering to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, well... Let's go on to our second topic for discussion then. So actually, um, it's quite a topical one of sorts um, because it's in line with The Apprentice, which recently finished on the BBC. And in fact, the, the runner-up was a St Albans-based um, businesswoman. Um, Nick Hewer, one of Lord Sugar's sidekicks, has been quoted as another public figure championing small business and encouraging people to go for it and pursue their ideas for a new business. He suggests that all you need to start a success 
successful business are some business cards, a website, focus and discipline. As simple as that. He also advocates that an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, even at the age of seven, suggesting that they're born and not raised or developed. So my question then is, does it really only take some business cards, a website, focus and discipline to start and run a successful business? And in fact, a second question, are entrepreneurs born or can you develop entrepreneurial spinach, spirit spinach, in anyone? <laughs> Cheryl? I think this is really interesting because I think there's two sides that you can look at this. On one side, you can say that he's really simplifying setting up a business, um, you know, saying that all you need is some business cards, where in fact you obviously need to have a really strong business idea. You might need some financial backing. You know, you need to have um, some skills to take that business forward. Um, but on the other side, I actually think that um, many businesses, if you have a strong business idea and if you already have those skills, that in fact all you do need is, you know, the basic tools of some business cards, some drive and, you know, a website in order to drive that business forward. If I think what I had when I set my business up, that's all I had. Um, and I went out and networked and met people and that's how I set my business up. So I think it depends on one way on what you do and what your business is. And another way, you know, you've obviously got to have those personal skills as well. Jason? I have to say, I, I tend to agree with that. One thing I would say, what about a phone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, computer. Honestly, yeah. Good no, point. That's phone, computer, yeah. I would yeah. say, uh, okay, I'm probably doing myself out of some business. I've known that many businesses saying, do you know what, I've been established 10 years, we've always done well, but for the first time now, I think I need a website. I've seen a lot of businesses start and run and be successful without a website. That said, I think it is a huge credibility problem if you don't have one. So whether you need the all singing and dancing website, I don't know. You certainly need a web presence. Um, that could be a simple blog, a free website, or a web page, or just you know evident on one of the social media platforms. But what I tend to see a lot with startups is sometimes they miss the obvious. And I remember someone once said to me about the first rule of sales sell something <laughs> I think, you know, simple as that sometimes it is just about getting out there with yeah. a phone and just talking to people yeah, yeah. yeah. do you think that the, how do you decide what sort of web presence you need for your business if you were to give us a brief overview how would you decide the best way to to make yourself known on the web I think, first of all, with certainly with social media platforms, what you can remember is, in a way, they're like the shopping centres they have footfall. They're like the different Arndale centres in the country. It's mm. free to register. So why wouldn't you set your business up with all of them? Now, whether you necessarily focus on all of them, that's a different matter. But they all have different values and, and a different value to your business. So I think, yeah, you definitely want to be evident on all of them. Um, in terms of which one, I think it depends. I think it depends what your market is, who you're trying to target. Mm -hmm. I think a common mistake business owners make is, I don't like Facebook, I don't understand it, therefore I won't use it. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, it's not about what you like, it's where your customers are. Mm -hmm. they, do, they do sometimes say things like, I'm not sure that my buyers are using social mm. media. Mm. Um, I mean, what would you, what would you say then? Oh, uh, Cheryl, maybe. Or? I think you can always sometimes be surprised the number of your you know target audience what they're using and who yeah. they're interacting with on different media but I think in some way it's true there are some businesses that perhaps don't work so well on Facebook that might work on other um, social media platforms and if you are going to have a social media presence it's really important that you actually make use of it because there's nothing worse than seeing a Facebook page with nothing on it yeah. so I think you do have to think quite carefully about which ones you're going to choose yeah it's interesting. As ever, we could go on and on and on, but would you believe our time's up? So <laughs> thank you both. And as ever, some great debate. And if you, our listeners, want to join in or suggest items for our panel discussion, then why not contact us on Twitter at RV the Business or email thebusiness at radioverilum.com. And as Cheryl says, we love, or was it Jason, that said you love to get little tweets and we love to get our tweets. Yes, we always love it. We always love uh, love uh, getting those. We want to be part of the social media revolution as we well do. So <laughs> as well as heated debate heated debate yes and uh, and, and so cheryl and jason uh, thank you very much thank you thank you community partners people living with cancer or life-threatening illness can often feel isolated confused and alone Grove House in Waverley Road, St Albans, leads the way in offering free specialist care and support to patients and their families affected by cancer and life-threatening illness in St Albans, Harpenden and Decorum. 
To find out more about their services, or how you can become a volunteer, or make a regular donation, or leave a gift in your will, phone 01727 731 000, or visit grove-house.org.uk. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. Join Simon Carver on Fridays from 6.30 p.m. for The Film Guide. We look at the UK Cinema Box Office Top 10, a selection of the new cinema releases and the best of the week's films on free-to-air TV. That's Fridays from 6.30 p.m. on West Hearts Drive Time with Danny Smith. Exclusively on Radio Varulam 92.6 FM. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on RadioVerulam.com. Yes, welcome back to The Business. It's just coming up to eight minutes to nine. Um, now, last week we had uh, Laura Moxham from Tech, Angel, uh, Tech Angels um, on, and fantastic um, she, she was too. And, um, of course, we always get the most out of our, our, our guests when we have them there. And so we also asked her to talk about uh, uh, her light bulb moments, top tips, and so on and uh, and so straight after the show we um i went and uh, talked to her about that and this is what she said my name is laura moxham from tech angels can you tell me when you started the business laura and if you have got any advice for other people starting a similar business well it was actually started out my by my brother in his back bedroom um, and I joined him four years ago. Uh, my side was more around um, wanting to develop a company with the basis of something that was working already um, with the appetite to, to grow it to some, you know, kind of a sizable situation. And what would you say that your best business decision has been to date? Um, I would say is letting go. Um, and letting the team around you de- deliver what you're trying to achieve um, and recognising the strengths that you have and, you know, the weaknesses as well. So those strengths, OK, develop those and, and nurture those as best you can. Um, and those that you're not so not so hot on, uh, work with your team or, or outside resources to enable you to take the business to where you want it to go. Just be honest with yourself. And is there any decision that you made that you thought, oh, gosh, I wish I hadn't done that? Is there a worst business decision? I don't think there's really been a worst decision. It's very similar to what I was saying there earlier um, about really looking at what you're not so good at and, and looking for additional coaches and help. Um, you know, and, and also one of the, the things that I've, I've really kind of trained my brain into is having 90 minute chunks. So in the morning, the, f- the first 90 minutes, I would be focusing purely on my business, developing my business, not touching emails, not answering the phone or anything like that, but developing the business. So I have two of those throughout the day. And that is, um, I, I guess, an outcome of the worst decision because I felt that I was fighting fires the whole time and actually responding to emails and being as quickly as I can for customers. But actually that isn't helping my business and my, my customers at all. So I rely on my team to do those sorts of things um, whilst I work on the more strategic act- activities that develop things within the business and for our customers. That's a very good tip. I must remember that one. And was there ever a light bulb moment when you were um, running the company that everything just sort of fitted into place? Um I think that once we got very involved in social media really was the light bulb moment um, because using these new tools based on, um, you know, the the main marketing strategies, which is about keeping um, uh, and developing customers. um, But it was around really communicating with them on a regular basis. So many other businesses I speak to, you say, where is your database? Well, I don't have them written down anywhere. How on earth are you keeping in contact with your customers? So the light bulb moment really is about communicating with your customers on a regular basis basis love them share them um, you know keep in contact with them keep in contact with them says uh, laura moxham from tech angels <laughs> <laughs> and um and very good guest she was last week wasn't she claire she was really excellent yeah and uh, and the first time she's ever done radio i know she was a complete I, natural I, I scarcely believed it it was uh, mm. it was it was uh, it was fantastic now we are into the uh, into the summer of course and so very often events there aren't quite as many around but we have this uh, the, the the diary roundup of what's happening and there are a few aren't there i think yeah, so um who's, who's going two. first well i'll um kick off with Ch- 
Chamber of Commerce who are holding an event on the 11th of September, so just going into the autumn. Um, the event is uh, called F The Five Most Common Gaps in Business Management and How They Can Stunt Growth and Shred Value. Just, just the five? Or? Just the five, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> um, John Dean's the Managing Director of Impulus, a... Uh, presume that's the correct pronunciation a leadership and management development organization based in St Albans um, the company's um, accredited an accredited center for the ILM and runs development courses across the UK for all sorts of large organizations um, they also run senior level courses for high growth potential businesses with the investor James Kahn so here John will reveal the five most common issues his clients face and how missing or ignoring them can have a big impact on profitability future growth both and profitability again um, there are some surprising ways to address them too so if you're interested in that event go to the St Albans Chamber of Commerce website and book yourself on. Fantastic I, I must put in a good word for John actually because I had I had personal experience of one of his talks once I turned up he was running a, a course out in uh, just off the M25 in Essex and on the day that the course was being run uh, he um, there was a huge pile up on the M25 oh. and there was like a mega mega jam and I was phoning him up and saying uh, you know oh, we, I'm going to be late or I'm going to be half an hour late or I'm going to be an hour late and he said <laughs> you shouldn't worry everyone else is having the same trouble I eventually got there to find I was the only person who had turned up <gasps> now most people would have said <laughs> said you know, you know forget, it. Right, forget it you yeah. know it's not worth running John actually, although we didn't do the full day, he actually sat down and talked to me for nearly half a day Brilliant. about what my particular challenges were in the area that he was mm. he was talking about at the time. So, um, you know, good bloke, worth mm. worth uh, worth listening to. Not many people would do that. No, mm. definitely so. not. Claire. Yeah, I've got one uh, networking event. It's actually coming up this Tuesday. So if you're listening to the repeat of this programme, this will not apply. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to catch you out with that one. Um, this group's called Four Networking and they're holding an event on Tuesday the 30th of July. It's in the Noak Thistle Hotel, which is in St Albans, and it's an evening event. It's from 6 to 8 o'clock, and the tickets are £15. Now, the good thing about this group is you can um, just turn up, and also they have regular meetups. So they have meetups every, every two weeks. So why don't you go along and give that a go? Absolutely. Uh, we've got a minute left. Um, uh, Roma, any reflections on, on what you heard this week? I think the whole Twitter thing, as usual, is interesting. And now that it's being used for um, research is also very interesting. I have to say, I've used it for a little bit of research. Mm. And it is very, it's as much interesting to see who tweets back yes. as it is what they tweet back. Yes. I think what Cheryl said was interesting, which is that people are very open on Twitter. Mm. So, so that, that where it would be difficult for you to get hold of somebody on a phone... They're quite happy if you if you get them on Twitter because it's less threatening. People feel quite comfortable with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think that personal aspect of Twitter was 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 really really came through very strongly. Um, well, that's about it for the business for this week. Remember, if you want to tweet us, uh, RV the business. Um, but that's it for tonight. So from me, Claire Aroma, very good night to you. You've been listening to the business on Radio Verulam. If there's anything in the show you want to talk to us about. Phone us on 01727 839 926 or email the business at radioverulam.com.